Catherine mentioned earlier that it was a bit like a high school reunion, and it's getting even more like a high school reunion, because uh, I worked with Mark at Radio Tees and Radio Air before I went into ITV and he went into BBC. Uh, and I'm incredibly jealous of him because he's had some of the jobs that anyone would dream of having. Uh, after radio, he became political correspondent for the BBC. He then became the BBC's first Europe editor. Imagine having your patch as Europe, uh, anywhere in Europe, doing that for four years. Uh, and then where do you go from Europe? Well, you take over America. So he became the North America editor for the BBC. So from having Europe as a patch, you then go to having North America as a patch, which is pretty cool. Uh, he's now back in the UK, uh, presenting one of the most influential news and current affairs programmes, The World This Weekend, on Radio 4, and particularly this year with the, the general election, uh, an incredibly uh, important programme uh, politically, but with a worldview as well. So, Mark, all yours. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, going to... Uh, if that suits everybody. I I'm adapting, as Mike said, after being away from this country for nearly 10 years. So the other day I got told off by a colleague for saying I wanted to go to the bathroom instead of the loo. And I'm having to tell my children off for saying things like vase. But apart from that, it's great being back. And it's great seeing Mike again, although he's just disappeared off. But he was... Uh, it's good being in Leeds as well, because that was my second job here in Leeds with Mike as editor. My first job was at Radio Tees, where he was also editor. And he's, uh, I've worked with a lot of the best in the business, but he really is one of the best. You're lucky to have him. He's a great editor. But I remember when I went for that first job at Radio Tees, Mike and others were interviewing me on the board. And one of the first questions was, um, what would you do if you're about to broadcast the early morning news, and one of the, the lead item is that one of the local manufacturers of bread, a mouse has been found in their sliced bread, and somebody rings up from the company and says, pull that story, or we're, we're going to pull all our advertising. You can't get hold of the editor, you can't get hold of the, the boss of the station, what do you do? Well, I think you all know the answer, but from the number of people who I work with who've gone into PR, maybe I should have uh, said I'd ring the company and tell them to advertise their meat-enhanced cereal bread-based snack. But that first job with Mike wasn't just about ethics, which is something he is very strong about, but also about developing the sharpness of the journalism, developing the style, and I think above all the craft skills, and I think that's something you're learning, and I, I can't stress enough how important that is, particularly in a first job, uh, first job, to hone that. But where did it all begin for me? Well, I, I, before I'd got those jobs, and I think the reason I, I got the first job was because I did a course in radio journalism at what was then called the London College of Printing. It was it's now, I think, uh, University of Westminster or something like that. Um, no, University of something or other in London. But uh, uh, doing a course in the practical side of it was very important. Uh, but before that, I did a degree in politics. And I think there was an element of the curse of karma, the idea that you reap what you sow comes in there. Because although I did politics, I wanted to do stuff that I regarded as really exciting, like the Chinese Revolution, uh, the Russian Revolution and the Soviet system, uh, fascism and where that came from, the, the, uh, the philosophy of politics. I wanted to avoid what I regarded as really boring things, like American politics, European politics, and British politics. And of course, that's what I've ended up covering most of my life. But it led to some good places. Uh, there's many different types of journalism and uh, types of journalists. And I don't know whether that's true of anything that people go into, whether there's a huge variety under the umbrella of the term. But I do think it's particularly true about journalism. And there's lots of things that some of my colleagues would find terribly exciting that I find fairly boring. But I think I've always wanted to answer the question behind the question. Why do things happen? Why do the broad events in the world that we see, why are they going on? You know, I, I, I always I say that there are, there are people, and it, you know, as I say, it must be very exciting, very glamorous and very dangerous covering wars, but I'm not so interested in when things go bang, but why they go bang in the first place and what happens after they've gone bang. And also, I mean, the people ask you, what, what are your best moments? And, and I get asked a lot, you know, about the people I've met. 
And for some people, the idea of meeting world leaders is, is, is exciting and interesting. Of course, it is in some ways. But I think I was inoculated against the lure of power at a relatively early age because I did so much Westminster politics. So I did interview these people. I did not only that, but observe them pretty close up, day after day. And I think that sort of makes you feel less in awe of people. Uh, when I was in uh, America, one of my editors back in London said, what we want you to do, what really impresses the audience is seeing you up there on Capitol Hill talking to senators. Well, I think that's what impressed him. I don't think it's what impresses the audience, and it certainly didn't impress me. What I wanted to do when I was in the United States, and I think I did, was travel a lot, talk to people a lot, and see what they thought, get under the skin of America, get under what was driving the big stories there. And obviously some stories, you know, like the Boston Marathon bombing just are, uh, well, they're certainly not discreet and, and unconnected with anything else, but that they, they are not part of a trend that one's, un, one's observing. But a lot of things, you can see that there are going to be stories along, if you like, a, a narrative arc. And I got a great deal of fun traveling the country doing that. I mean, sometimes little incidents can give you an insight into the, the way that people are thinking. During the uh, 2012 election, I was... Uh, down in Florida, and it was, it was the, one of the party conferences down there. Uh, but we were on, uh, on, the, on St. Pete's Beach, which is a sort of a, a fishing and bathing area, and we were, were talking to people. And there's this old lady who's, or middle-aged lady, who was fishing off the end of a pier, and I talked to her for a bit, and it was clear that she was relatively conservative. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> but I, you know, I said to her, who are you going to vote for? And she said, oh, I... I haven't made my mind up yet. And I thought, well, fair enough. And I started to move off, and she came up to me and sort of beckoned me close and said, but all you need to know about that Obama is the film The Omen. Now, if you don't know The Omen, <laughs> it's about the Antichrist. Now, it told me something. If she couldn't decide between the man she thought was the Antichrist and Mitt Romney, <laughs> Mitt Romney probably wasn't going to win. And during the coverage of the Tea Party, the right-wing movement which some people compare, I think relatively accurately, although there are lots of differences, but to the UK Independence Party, there are, there are similarities. Again, I, people in uh, one of the big flaws, I think, of American media coverage is that people stick in the big city centres, and that of, often does mean uh, uh, you know, the east and west coast, and see what's going on, but take their own opinions and, and then put them on. It's a lot about opinions rather than actually talking to people and getting beneath that. So people who are sympathetic to the Tea Party movement uh, think that, you know, we'll say there's no racism in it at all. It's nothing like that. It's nothing to do with that. People, and there's far more in the media who are on the liberal side, will say, well, the, the Tea Party is just driven from the Republican centre. It's just big business creating this false grassroots movement. Uh, but I, you know, I've been out there and talked to people, and it's one of the things I learned going around the Texas State Fair and, uh, and sort of various other places where you get people gathering. I went to a flea market in Kentucky, which was fantastic. In fact, the story I remember from there was that um, I, was, and I was doing this for a radio documentary, so I was sort of deliberately chatting, chatting people up, and I was saying, oh, you know, you've got, you've got an uh, an automatic rifle on sale there, or, you know, in, in this little stall that also had knickknacks and bottles and stuff like that. You know, you'd never see see that in Britain. You just can't imagine seeing that in Britain. You could, that's why I feel sorry for you. You've lost your freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and but that is the way that you know a lot of people who support the Tea Party see that the right to have a rifle is about freedom. But and and I got from uh, you know dozens of meetings with people from the Tea Party, that whether you like it or not, it's a real movement, it's very strong, and among a certain section of the population, mainly white, mainly rural, it's, it's a really strong movement that it's difficult for politicians to deny. Although I must say, the best sort of story I got out of covering the Tea Party, or at least the one that most appeals to my uh, teenage children, is when a guy came up, bounded up to me with enthusiasm and said, Hi, I'm Randy Virgin. <laughs> my producer said, you can't put that on the screen. You can't put the, you know, the Aston, the strap. You can't put that. Said, well, that's his name. You know. <laughs> so it was a good lesson. You can't actually not tell the truth because you find the truth slightly embarrassing. 
Or, you know, another time I, 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 I was proud of is, is taking Nigel Farage to Romania before they joined to meet some of the people he said couldn't come in. It doesn't seem to have changed his mind very much, but it was a good encounter for television. More recently, dur during the, or after, in the aftermath of the uh, Char Charlie Hebdo killings, we went to the Banlieu, the, the depressed areas of uh, the suburbs outside Paris where the, uh, the murderers worshipped and, and lived, and just talking to people there about their fears, people who were going into the mosque and worshipping there, and saying that, you know, this makes us vulnerable. My son's been beaten up at school. My son's been spat on. People are attacking us. Skinheads will come to the area. And that was just, you know, it's a great insight <clears throat> that, you know, you don't get from just sitting in a studio and pontificating. Um, and I think, you know, that's, if I've got any skills, one of, one of the... Or, one of the things I've got is curiosity. I genuinely want to find out about that. And I think it's a very important journalistic uh, uh, thing to have. <clears throat> now, I mean, I'm sure that you'll be hearing lots of advice. Now, is, is there any water around? Sorry, there's some there, isn't there? No, no, I don't want to say any. Excuse me. Water break. Um, you get lots of advice this week. One of the skills I haven't got is opening bottles of water, obviously. I have a producer to do these sort of things. <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> Sorry. Commercial break. Just playing out about. Uh, so you get lots of advice about what to, uh, how to get that vital first break, and you know we can talk about that perhaps later on, but. And I know it's difficult. I know that's the first and most important thing. But don't forget, when you get there, I mean, that's what I think from my experience. Yes, the, the journalism course I did was important. But what I learned in those first two jobs, how to craft things, how to react when, you, when you're there, how to show people you are the best. I mean, there's a difficult balancing act between you want to be enthusiastic and... Uh, uh, but you don't want to be like a sort of bouncing puppy dog that can't stand still. But, I mean, what you want to show people is how good you are at the job. And, I mean, this is saying the obvious, but I, I, I also, as well as The World This Weekend, do uh, The World at One on Fridays and, um, and when, when Martha is off. Um, so it really strikes me. It's very interesting sitting there as a presenter, listening how people go about uh, the job of getting our guests, because The World at One, I hope, sounds a very calm, level-headed programme, but it's, it's frenetic. I mean, I start pretty early. I, I get in at about uh, six, but the, the team has a meeting that is meant to finish around nine where we decide what stories we want. Not all of them are going to make, but you probably leave the meeting with five or six stories in your head, and, and each producer is assigned people to get uh, so, to, so you can build up that sequence, you know, from the ideal guest to the one... Uh, you know, that we really don't want to put on air and you probably end up somewhere in the middle. But I'm struck by the difference in approach of people. So you'll hear some people say, uh, this is so-and-so from the world at one, um, we'd really like you to come on uh, at lunchtime. Um, I mean, obviously, if you can't make it, it doesn't matter, but, you know, I'd quite like you to phone me back. And other people will, will say, you are the person that would make this program. If we can get you the leading expert in the country on this program. It will make so much difference to our audience. You are the one person, and I've looked at all the people that we could, could do this, who can explain to our audience exactly what this means. And it's just that, that level of, of and then, then you go on from there, that you know, when they say, well, no, actually, you know, I, I was going out for lunch. And you know, the, the, the persuasion, the steel, a lot of journalism and I, is about not taking, you know, not refusing to take a no as an answer. I mean, I, I qualify that. Obviously, when there's people in a sensitive situation or who suffers tragedies, there is a time when it's important to, to accept that no and to go away. But it's that steeliness of a, of a almost of a, like a door-to-door -door brush salesman that you're going to get that. You're determined you're going to get that. And if that falls down, you'll get something even better. But I think when I started out, I, I was in a... In a, in a lucky environment, because there were, it was an expanding world of commercial radio, there were jobs there, whereas, of course, at the moment, we're cutting back. I mean, I, I wonder, and I, I don't really know whether this is true or not, but I wonder whether the, the, we're going to see a world where, where people like the BBC and others 
will accept far more material from people. I mean, they talk about citizen journalism now. But, you know, I, I just wonder, and again, it's something we can talk about if you want to, about whether there's opportunities just to get out there and do stories, make stories and sell them. And, and you know, that I, I know if we had come across somebody during the Ebola crisis who was working out there as an aid worker, who did a video diary, who did a, re well, a video diary for online, but, you know, did a diary, a radio diary, we'd have snapped that up, we'd have loved stuff like that. And I think the, the same goes for, you know, other difficult places in the world where, our reporters are often very busy, don't have time to do more, um, uh, more uh, stuff that's catered to our, our own needs. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, and I was talking to some, um, some other students the other day, and I was saying that, I, I was just trying to reflect on what the difference was, that if I got a good story, if I wasn't working for, uh, for uh, the radio stations, if when I was at college, I'd got what I thought was a, a stunning story, I'd have to flog it to somebody, I'd have to sell it to somebody, I'd ring up the Evening Standard, I'd ring up whatever, try to get that, that article or whatever it was published. You don't have to do that now, you can just put it on, on a blog and, and, uh, and try and attract attention, try and drive traffic towards it. Again, I don't know how much that's, that's a reality, I mean there's lots of blogs out there that people won't read, but I think that the, the, the difference in the environment is huge, but I think in a way, um, it, it, it's, you're, you're in a lucky position. Uh, I was just thinking back as well to those first days uh, with, um, with Mike Best, and I was thinking about one of the things that you, you learn on the job is just how to, to hone news scripts. And I was, I was just, uh, just remembering what it was like coming in. And one of the things that came back to me was that you come in, to, in the morning with a pile of scripts before you, and you've got to make the seven and eight and nine o'clock news out of that. And just the sort of the journalistic skill of writing, of, of which will never, never leave you, being able to spot the angle, spot the sound bite, spot the picture, is very important to develop. And it just struck me that the number of cues that I read, picked up in the morning, and it begin, the Policy and Resources Committee of Wakefield Council has decided that, and you know, that the, that's not going to ever grab an audience, is it? But these were trained journalists who were writing it. And, you know, sort of... Lower down, it would uh, would say that the, the historic centre of Wakefield uh, City was going to be burnt down and replaced by uh, Malice, Madame Salop's Whip Emporium or something. And you thought, you know, they didn't spot that story. They didn't spot it. So it's, you know, it's a lot of focusing on what's really going to grab ordinary people, the audience's attention. And I'm going to go back to the, another question from Mike Best, when I got the job at Radio Air. It was um, another ethical question about, and I think somebody had actually um, committed the sin that he was, he was questioning about. If there are floods in Leeds, uh, and you couldn't get there, for maybe because of the floods, uh, floods in York, sorry, floods in York, and you couldn't get there because of the floods in York, was it all right to go out into the car park in the rain and record a voicer about it? Seems Mike was prefiguring the BBC's big report on trust by uh, several decades there. So, trust, honesty, curiosity, skill, and luck, a bit of all those, and I'm sure you'll make it. So, but now over to um, whatever you want to ask. Hello. <laughs> um, well, they've all got big egos. Most of them, people, you know, it's one of the things that drives politics, people into politics, is their egos. Um, and I think, I think you can uh, prick their pomposity and take them down a, a, a degree or two. In terms of objectivity, in terms of putting your own views on the side, I mean, I suppose I've been doing it for so many years that I would say it isn't difficult. And in fact, you know, I, I, I would say... I, I, I find it sort of, I think, second nature. Um, 
and I get into more trouble with friends who will sort of say some opinion about a politician, aren't they dreadful, and, you know, because they said so-and-so. And I'll say, well, they didn't actually quite say that. How they were quoted was wrong because what you've read is not <laughs> completely accurate. And people oh, no, but you must hate them, you know. So, well, I may do, sort of privately hate them, but, you know, you've also got to get the facts right. So, so I think I do feel quite strongly that, you know, you, you can, people can have their own views. It's my job to um, supply the facts on which they base that, that. Now, you do get into a more difficult area when, you, when you're an editor, when you're a political correspondent, because part of the job is not just judging, um, you know, well, not just the facts, but it is judging why they're doing something, their motives, what, what the reaction is likely to be from other people. And you will get people who write in and saying, you're just giving your opinion. Well, you are just giving your opinion an extent, to an extent, but it's like... You know, the person in the garage, if you take your car in, is just giving his opinion when he think, says, I think it's the, the main block of the engine that's gone, you know, that you're giving your opinion, but it's based on years of experience and, and, and observation. Um, and I do think objectivity isn't just for, you know, British politics. I think, for instance, you know, I do, I do find it quite difficult when looking at what's going on in Russia and Ukraine to take Putin's uh, claims seriously. I mean, I don't have any trouble saying in public that I, I, I think they're a load of nonsense, but, I mean, when you're on air, you've got to give them a fair shout. You've got to give the other view, you know, if they're maintaining, we're not in Ukraine, we're not sending troops there, you've got to at least reflect that and from time to time have people talking about it and, and defending their position. And in, in the interview, you, if you think that they're not telling the truth, you can attempt to, to reveal that. But I think it's, it's an important principle in a, in a more complex world that people are allowed to express their views um, from all, all angles. Hello. Not compared to America. <laughs> um, it's refreshing how interested people do seem. Um, I mean, America is sort of understandable in, in, in that it is such a big country, and it's. Uh, and what I, I'm just going off at a tangent. I will ask you, answer your question. But I mean, you know, what surprised me in America wasn't just that people weren't interested in in abroad. They weren't interested in America either very much. So that the sort of journalism they do means that you know, that they will sit in a studio and pontificate about what Kansas is like or what Florida is like without sending reporters down there and going to talk about it. And you'll get a, a panel um, of four men talking about unemployment. If you're really lucky, you'll get a panel of three men and a woman. If you're really lucky, you'll get three, three white men and a black woman. But, yeah, they won't actually send somebody down to talk to people who are unemployed about what it's like and the struggle of getting a job. So, I mean, that, that's America. Um, I, I suppose, you know, because I work for a, a, a station Radio 4 where there is a lot of focus on international news, I, I don't notice that people aren't interested. And I think that probably more than in the past, you know, I mean... I, I think there's, there's often editors will, would often say, show people how it's relevant to us in Britain, what impact it makes. That's always a good thing to, to do. But you don't have to do that very hard with Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, maybe a bit more about Ukraine, you know, that you do. But I mean, uh, the, the relationships with, with Russia are obvious, you know, we're in NATO, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's obviously involves us. So. I, th I don't feel that there's a, a lack of curiosity about the world. Hello? Um, do you think the three major political parties in Britain now, which everyone's talking about, are the kind of thought that's between them? Do you think that's down to the media? Yeah, I mean, some people are saying that there is a huge amount between Labour and the Tories at the moment. I mean, the, the, it's quite interesting. That in terms of their economic plans, there are economists who are saying there's, there's an immense amount of, of difference between their actual plans. But I think it is, in a, in a sense, the media's fault that they feel the same, that they feel constrained. I mean, and I do occasionally have a twinge of sympathy because 
any time a politician says something honest and personal, well, not necessarily personal, but honest about the way they feel, uh, they're jumped on and it's seen as a gaffe. Well, it isn't necessarily a gaffe. Um, sometimes it is. Uh, but, and I, I, I think it is the pressure of politics and the media that makes them sound so much the same. And probably, is, I think, for a start, it's driven a lot of people out of politics that I think a lot of people who might have gone into politics will think, maybe I did something when I was your age that I don't want to see on the front page of The Sun, so I'll go and make money somewhere else, a lot more money somewhere else. I think also, and this has always been true, but because of the amount of media and amount of media focus, when you've got a politician on and they say something horribly bland, it is because they're thinking, well, I haven't sold this to the shadow cabinet. I know the shadow chancellor hates this policy, so I've got to be careful here. But I know what I personally feel. I don't know how it's going to go down with the voters because the focus groups seem to really like it. So you're walking a, a delicate line. And I, I still think that you know, the people who have the, the greatest appeal um, are those who either because they're like that or more often because they find themselves in a political position where they can uh, talk freely are, are, the, are those who are often seen as most appealing. I'm thinking of people like Farage, like Boris Johnson, like in America Chris Christie, who come across, and they're, they're all rather blokey as it happens, but I don't think it has to be, but people who are authentic. And I, you know, I think that's, I think also I was just talking to Mike outside actually, I think it's a very important thing about, uh, about journalism. We were talking about what makes good TV journalists. I think it's, it's coming across as yourself. I know some brilliant people who really know their subject backwards. And it's not that they, they freeze when they get in front of a camera because they're used to it, but they, they just don't feel that they can, they feel their, their personality is separate from, from their, uh, their knowledge. And you know, it's almost an academic approach. And, and I think that the, you know, authenticity is, is very important in, in being trusted, really. Hello? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's something I, you know, I do struggle with. I mean, less now in, in on the world this weekend because I think that's one of the things that the programme does. But, yeah, you're right. In a, in a two-and-a-half-minute news report, it's often going to get squeezed out. And so I, I, I suppose it's, you know, it's the way that you approach the story. It's often difficult talking about these things without concrete examples. But, you know, I, I would always, you know, if I was an editor or if I was the correspondent doing the story, I don't think you can just do a... Uh, you know, a war story by saying, children dying, bang, here's me in my hard hat, crash, you know, like sort of, it is terrible, you know, and I, I think that's, that's really, really missing something out. I think you've got to try and paint a bit of a picture about who's attacking who, why it happened, where it comes from. I mean, the difficulty, as you say, and that's why documentaries are a, another way of doing it, and, you know, that where do you go back to? I mean, how far do you go back? I mean, classically, when, when you talk about the conflict in the Middle East. Do you go back to the Six Day War? Or do you go back to when the Romans kicked the Jews out of Israel, you know, which is actually sort of where the problem comes from. But you're not in a news report going to go back, you know, 2,000 years. So I think, I mean, the word we use in the BBC is context. Try and give context to a story. Um, and I, I, th I think half the battle is thinking about it and realising that it's important to do it. And then how you weave that in through odd little words and, and phrases and, and, you know, sort of if you can get a bit of t extra time off the editor or maybe a clip from somebody who can explain it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and, and it's the first thing that goes when they say, oh, you've only got one and a half minutes instead of two and a half minutes because you've still got to tell the story. But I think being aware of it is a very important thing.
most uh, the greatest enemy of press freedom um, in a generation. Would you say post post medicine that we're becoming a little bit more um, as journalists a little bit more tame? I think there's always that danger. I think it's slightly unfair on Obama. <laughs> <laughs> when you look, look around at the enemies of press freedom in the world. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I think that, I think the, you know, undoubtedly real threat of terrorism uh, is being, you, uh, is it being used? It's being, I don't know, I, I mean, used, suggest used as an excuse, but it is one of the things that's constraining people, and, and that worries me, that people are unwilling to say things because of how it will be perceived, that the that journalists are clearly aware that their conversations could be monitored and they could possibly get into trouble, but more that their, their contacts are being followed. Um, the whole business with um, WikiLeaks, I mean, has was it was interesting and raised important questions. I mean, I thought it was it was rather incontinent, and not in the sense that we shouldn't or people shouldn't have revealed those things, but there was just rather sort of a splurge of information rather than saying, this is something that you need to know about because it's bad. It was just saying, this is something that's happened. That, and, you know, I have, some again, some sympathy for the diplomats who feel they can't be honest about the nature of Sarkozy, say, uh, because they might, you know, have it revealed in, in the... Uh, um, uh, in the in the public print or or on the media, so in some way, Levinson and and Hutton, I think as well. I, I think that does make people think twice when maybe they shouldn't. I mean, I think it does restrain people. I mean, you know, certainly at the BBC, and we are you know funded out of public money. We do have a a, a, a legal and moral duty to our audience, and we should think very seriously about how, uh, and do constantly, about how our coverage is, is being taken. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I would always hope journalists would try to be bold and try not to be overawed by what the establishment wants them to broadcast. Um, but, I, you know, I, th I, I think you can, you can look at this point in time and say, you know, now is a dangerous time, a difficult time for journalism. But I think you could have looked in, in, in another context 10 years or 20 years or 40 years ago, and there will always be different pressures on people, and always people who will resist that, and always people who will crumble. Hello? Yeah, um, definitely. I think it already has. I think the, the uh, uh, both the Conservatives and Labour have toughened up, if you want to, for want of a better phrase, their line on immigration. I mean, David Cameron went through an extraordinary twisty journey uh, where he appeared to suggest that he was going to... Um, rewrite the entire rules of the European Union until they told him that was not possible. So he had a lesser ambition now, which he seems to have got away with at the moment. Um, Labour are... Some people in Labour are equally worried by the rise of UKIP, and there are those, and among academics and uh, commentators, who think actually in the long term Labour is more at risk. It's the... Uh, disillusioned working class voter that's more likely to go to UKIP than the Conservative vote. I, I think there's something in that argument. Um, and they have definitely, you know, changed their stance on on immigration and their people in the party like Frank Field who, who want to go down a, a more, uh, you know, a, a route of saying that the EU should, uh, should again abandon free movement of people. So I think it will, ha has had an effect. It'll be interesting to see in the election how much immigration plays. I mean, I thought it would play very large. I'm not sure that they won't be squeezed. It'll be there, and it may be there in individual constituencies, um, and certainly in areas like Thanet where they're campaigning hard to win a seat. I think the national picture, you know, the two big subjects are going to be, and this is what the Conservatives want it to be, but you can argue that this is 
actually what elections should be about, and you know, that they are central to any democracy, how you run the economy and who should lead the country. Um, so they're going to certainly thunder away at that, and I think that's probably what the main issues will, will be with immigration popping up from time to time. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I sort of automatically, when you say UKIP, talk about immigration, but I do think that's what they're about uh, or what their appeal is. I don't think that the idea of leaving the European Union has a lot of resonance aside from, from that. I mean, it, I'm not saying people don't want to leave it, but I don't think people feel passionately about that. Um, and I think, you know, that the, their other issues aren't, aren't as strong. I think their rise is because of concerns about, about immigration. Anybody else? Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how you get those bits into your, your, your two minutes and don't make the epidemic hold too fast out as a result. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, well, that's, that's right. I mean, I, I think in TV terms, I mean, you know, when Mike and I were talking about this sort of the skill of writing for, for TV, I mean, which I think is, is, is a fascinating subject. Um, but we were just saying about how, I mean, I saw a report on the BBC the other day, you know, the business about where the World Cup is and, and Qatar and not holding it during the summer. And so, so you know, what, what's that story about? It's about a very hot country where the correspondent was. So he starts with a picture of a man walking into a room. Um, later on in the piece, he does have shimmering beaches and people in burqas sitting on them and all that. But, you know, to me, that is just appalling television, you know, that... that <laughs> And I, I just don't see how that... And there's a report that went out several times. Nobody sort of phoned him up and said, come on, mate, what are you thinking of? Um, so, yeah, you know, I think th you do have a responsibility to, to... I mean, it's just sort of basic... Uh, what grabs people? What's going to pull them in? And, you know, you don't always... Not every report one does does that, but, I mean, what's the... What's the gra that's what I was trying to say, and I don't know that I said it very well in the, when I was talking about it, but about the, about the sort of the Policy and Resources Committee has decided, you know, look for the grabbiest line. I mean, again, I'm not sort of saying, you know, this is brilliant, but on, on the way in on Sunday to do the programme, we knew that we were going to lead, almost certainly, on the march in Russia. And I was just trawling through a whole load of stuff on, on my iPhone in, in, uh, on my way in, and I wasn't driving myself. Um, um, and I hadn't seen this before, but uh, uh, Boris Nemtsov was, had given an interview just hours before he was killed to Polish Newsweek. Um, and so I was read, read through it, of course. And he said, talking about the march that he had planned for the Sunday that was converted into a march in his, his uh, memory, he said, it takes very great courage to go in the streets in Russia in these days. And I thought, that's it. That's the opening line of the program. And it's that sort of, you know, it, it, it's just being aware. I mean, you don't always get the right line. You don't always, but how, how am I going to make people sit up and, and notice this report, I think, is, is always really important. I mean, what's your, your thoughts about it?
Yeah. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree with that. About making your own luck, it just reminded me, I've, I've told two stories about my interviews for my jobs, but uh, the, 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 again, the first job, when I came up to Radio Tees to be interviewed by Mike, I was on the, on the train and uh, going up, and uh, I thought, well, you know, the, my whole selling point is that I understand broadcasting. I'm a good broadcaster. I mean, I'm not pretending I know anything about this area, but oh, yeah, I I'll, I'll, might as well read the Northern Echo. And there was some story about some plant closing. And they asked me, what would you do in the morning? And I said, well, you know about this plant closure? And they said, oh, afterwards, that's what got you the job. So, yeah, you can never know too much, you know, that it just goes and you read stuff. I mean, I, I, and the internet makes it a nightmare, doesn't it? I mean, there's so much to read. And, that, you know, I used to think in Europe, there's just, how do you cover the then 27, now 28 countries of the European Union, given that you also want to know about, you know, sort of Turkey and accession countries? And then America, is, there's so much written about America. Now I regard you know, both of those as specialist subjects. I also am really interested in China um, and, of course, the Middle East and Russia are burning stories. So, you know, you could just, you could just literally read from the, day, the hour you get up to when you go to bed without any time for broadcasting. But, uh, or thinking, yeah. No, they're not, and it's a cultural thing. And I, you know, I don't know whether it's just reporters, or whether it's the whole country. We're just not used to coalition politics, and we're gradually getting there. Um, and it, you know, frankly, it makes this election a nightmare for us. Not the coalition element, but the the number of parties that are involved. I mean, I, I understand, and don't quote me on this because I may not have got the phrases right. But the BBC is no longer going to talk about balanced coverage, but comprehensive coverage. Because you've got, you know, you've got as what are called the three main parties. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about two-party politics, but it's definitely three-party. But we've got UKIP, but we've got the SNP. And then, and then you quite understandably, the Greens want to say, and so do Plaid Cymru will say, well, what about us? And the Northern Ireland parties are saying that. But we you know, were just talking in the office the other day about the more sophisticated... If you're allowing the SNP a say, do you have to let Scottish Labour have a say back. Not Labour, the Scottish Labour, because it's different. So do you, you add that into the mix. But going back to your question on coalition politics, I think we're not used to it. We're not used to coalitions making compromises. Um, and I think it's fair enough that people are, you know, accused of betrayal and tearing up their principles. But I mean, that's... I remember doing a, a story about a, a coalition government in... I'm pretty sure it was the Netherlands. And the... I don't know which party it was, but they had torn up, rather like the Lib Dems on tuition fees, one of the central planks of their manifesto policy. So I did this, what I thought was you know, a good, hard-hitting interview. Don't you realise you have betrayed your voters? You have... He said, yeah, that's what happens in coalition politics. <laughs> and he's quite right. You have to give stuff up. So I, I agree completely that we're not used to it. Well, I mean, he is trying to avoid them. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that, that nobody seriously believes that he feels so strongly about the Greens and then the Northern <laughs> Ireland Party that, you know, it's a bit like somebody say, saying, um, who doesn't want to go out, you know, well, no, I won't come to the party unless, unless so-and-so comes. Oh, she can come. Yeah, but I want so-and-so as well. You know, I don't think all of my friends are coming. You know, no, nobody's really sort of... I mean, you know, I think, I think it's a generally accepted principle that if you are... He's not the front-runner, but if you are the leader in power, you have far more to lose. And we saw that in the last debates, that uh, Clegg was thought to have done terribly well. And, you know, that was one of the reasons, possibly, for the, incre or the, the way that the, the Lib Dems did very well and were... Seen as, seen as credible. Um, so I don't think it's you know, foolish of him to try and avoid them, but I think it would be very difficult uh, now to do so. What do I think? I, th you know, I think they, they're a good thing. I, my, my worry about them is that they, the whole campaign 
you know, the gravity of them, they're like a black hole, that the whole campaign is sucked into them. And certainly you see that in the US, where the, uh, there are a series of debates as well, and that the whole week is running up to them, the debate itself, analysing what happened afterwards. Um, and I suspect, I, I've, I've lost track actually, I must catch up how many we're having or what we're having. Um, but I think there is a danger that you don't have that, you have a focus just on that. And I wonder how much that satisfies people. Um, but, it, you know, in the, in the it's, it's become a decreasing factor in elections, but what used to be important was the morning press conferences. And that's where almost the issue of the day would be decided. Um, you're traipsing around sort of a very small part of Westminster going from one press conference to the, to the next. I think that's less true. So there's always some sort of locus, some sort of focus for, for the campaigns. Yes, Chris. I mean, again, compared to America, none of them are nasty. They're, they're politeness themselves. I think, I think it's, in, it's, it's an interesting, uh, and I don't, I don't know how much on a local level it will be like that, but I think because one of the issues is, frankly, is Miliband up to the job? And it's a very important central question that the Conservatives will exploit to the hilt. Because I think, you know, I, well, I know, I mean, a lot of people within the Labour Party think the answer is no. So um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, um, um, very good from their point of view thing to, to try and bring out. So in that sense, it's nasty. But you notice already Labour have said, well, we won't be doing any personal ads. We won't be attacking Cameron. We won't be. Uh, mocking him, you know, well, because it's, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, and I, but I think that what they will do is try and find any uh, examples of st stuff that says the Conservatives are toffs and out of touch and a rich elite. So I don't know how nasty it will get. I mean, I, I, you know, the, the American elections get so unpleasant. They're so, I mean, for a start, they can get away with completely telling lies rather than sort of hinting at stuff that may not be true. It, it can be very personal, um, and and the level of vitriol, and the level of vitriol that people feel, I think as well. I mean, there are people who loathe Obama, really, in, in a way that I don't think people probably they may may have done about Thatcher, but I don't think think about many uh, British politicians. But you know, people I've interviewed who who say about Obama, there's something about him I don't like. I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, I think I can, <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, so so race is is, is a lot to do with people's feeling. But the, the, you know, equally on the other side, that there's there's such a hatred. Uh, it is much more like two camps at war than than's true here, where I think it's quite an easy crossover. Yeah, um, well, I suppose I'll pick up on the last point first. First of all, there's, of course you want to make it fresh, but there's also sort of you will, uh, and with a White House press, there's, particularly if it's international, there'll be things that interest a British audience that or, uh, don't interest an American one and vice versa. I mean, the sort of the latest American political scandal won't play as big here over something that he might have said as on Iran or Afghanistan. But also the, the thing that you all know as journalists from watching the press, there's sort of not necessarily agreed lines, but either because we're, because there is something that is outstandingly, obviously, the most important thing from this news conference, or because we're guilty of groupthink, or because certainly and this happens in Westminster, you know, people actually do literally put their heads together and say, this is what we're going with. Um, so all of those things happen. Um, if, if, if there's a doubt about it, you know, you'd probably go back to your editor and, you know, depending on the 
there's, there's usually more of a structure. It's not just out of the blue. You're there at the news conference for a particular reason. Um, but you might go back to an editor and say, look, there's a great line on Iran, but also a great one on Afghanistan. Shall we just do it as Obama's foreign policy and get them both in? And he'll say, well, I mean, actually, we've got a report from Iran which we've been had for a couple of weeks. We'll just take the, uh, take the clip from that. No, 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 you can't do that. I want to do I tell you what, I'll stand outside the White House and talk about it. Um, so, uh, and what's the, what's the mood? I mean, it, you know, you do feel a sort of frisium going inside the White House and, and, you know, sort of sitting there in the news conference. I mean, the, the frustrating thing from a, a British point of view is that, uh, you know, you're, as, as somebody told my colleague Matt Fry, you're on No Votes TV. <laughs> um, so, so that you, you're not going to get a... They know exactly what, who, who's going to ask the questions, and they're from the... You know, they've got five major networks, so they're going to be the five major TV networks and maybe one from the Washington Post, and that's it. Um, yeah, I do, yeah. Um, I think it's going to be um, a rerun of the TV programme Dynasty. It's going to be Bush versus Clinton, you know. The, the sort of, it's slightly depressing about American politics that uh, although they don't have the hereditary principle, they sort of do. Um, I can't see anything beyond, you know, sort of ill health or Bill's ill health derailing Hillary. Um, there's no serious challenger. Uh, to her within the Democrats. Um, and I'm not even sure anybody's going to stand against her. I th it's less clear that it will be Jeb Bush. I think it's pretty obvious now that he is going to stand. His trick is to get past the right to the Tea Party. Can he appeal to them? And it may be uh, that he can't. I mean, I, I was at a Tea Party meeting in, in Washington shortly before I left, and somebody was saying, and I can't remember they're quoting somebody British, but I'm not sure they're saying that, Somebody said, I want the most conservative person possible who can win. And his buddy butted in, I just want the most conservative person possible. I don't care whether they can win. And, you know, which of course sounds foolish, but I mean, the idea is that the purity of the party, getting it to a place where they think it is correctly conservative, is more important than actually getting in the White House. And, and there is that sort of view, so that he could be seen on several issues, uh, particularly um, Latino immigration. As, as too liberal, and I think. If, but if it comes down to them, I don't know. I mean, the the, the last elections obviously went the Republicans' way in, in the in the um, midterms, the congressional midterms. I, I think the demographics still, in terms of age, in terms of race, point towards the Democrats. So I think it's very possible there could be a woman in the White House. Hello. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that is a big problem, isn't it? That uh, it's, a, it's a problem for us, who, all of us who want to make our livings out of journalism. <laughs> but, I mean, may, maybe you're uh, uh, better than I am on this, but, I mean, I, you know, I feel a burning outrage that The Times is trying to charge me to... And I, you know, I'll have nothing to do with it. And I'm now cross with The Telegraph as well, which seems to be telling me I can only read a certain number of... Uh, Articles a month, but if you put the porn filter on, you I mean, put the private browsing, you can get into those sites. I mean, yeah, that um, um, I, I think uh, I, mean, I think people do expect it for free, um, and you know the BBC has a, a because it is uh, well, it's not for free, but I mean, it's for, once you pay the license fee, it's, it's out there. You know, is is in a sort of privileged position uh, like that. I think I think it's not just our industry, but you know, sort of music, uh, that that sort of and other other things, you know, that you people expect to be able to get for free, that presents a, a challenge of how do we pay for it, um, and you know, I suppose, because luckily my job isn't sort of management where I have to think about the economics. I haven't thought as much as as I uh, I, I should, but I mean, I you know, I use free sites wherever I can. Um, 
And, and I think that it is a great boon, the, the idea, as, as, as I'm only, only just thinking about this um, in relation to another chat I had with, I mean, actually, at the kids at uh, my, my kids' school, um, but about, you know, just putting your stuff out there and how, how much that can be a way forward, and I tend to think will be. Um, and I think we've got to explore different ways of doing things constantly, not be... I, I mean, people of my generation, particularly in the BBC, can be a bit scared by the whole social media thing, but not just scared, but over-impressed. They, they're just sort of mesmerised by it. They know it's really important. You know, they, they think they're really up with the kids because they do Twitter. And, you know, they sort of don't realise that things move very rapidly and, and how we move, you know, from platform to platform, how we we do stuff on all of them, I, I, I don't quite know, and I don't think we're, we're quite up there with it, but I think it's important to develop. They're, 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 they're getting their reporters for free. Yeah, like, so you tell them you lie, you like I haven't really. Well, yeah, it's it's you know it's not it's not good, is it? I can understand people wanting to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, it's part of the problem. It's it's like in you know again, in, it's worse in America than here. But interning, it's you know, it's pretty disgraceful that people work. You know, with with good degrees, or just as disgraceful if they've got bad degrees or no degrees, but I mean, people, people are, what I'm saying is highly talented, who should be, be being paid a salary, are going and sitting there because they might eventually get a job. And of course, the temp temptation is they don't get a job, you just get the next one along who's free. So, I mean, it's something that, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I instinctively, I don't know enough about it, but I instinctively really disapprove of it. Um, but then there's always a a blurred line, isn't there? I mean, you know, I, I do stuff for free, you know, for, um, well, I, you know, I, I suppose if I, if I was, I'm trying to think what I, but, you know, I've done stuff for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, you know, they ring up, say something's happening, they're a fellow national broadcaster, I wouldn't <laughs> necessarily expect a check in the post from them for doing something like that. So, I'm mean, not, you know, I can afford to, okay, I've got a, got a good job as it is. But, you know, I can, and I suppose when we're talking about citizen journalism, there's, there's a line that's blurred between I was there and this is, you know, I took pictures out of it on my iPhone and I've edited it and added a, added a script, you know, that I, so I think you, but it's, I, it's something I hadn't thought about and will. I think the licence fee works. I mean, I think that, you know, this, this is the party line and this is sort of semi-public, so in a sense I've got to, got to take the party line, but I won't entirely and I hope I don't get into trouble for it. I, I don't think anybody now sensibly would start off saying, proposing something like the licence fee, but it works. It's relatively cheap. You get a huge range of services for it. Um, and, you know, for, for that reason alone, I would say don't touch it, you know, increase it in line with inflation. Um, and we, does the, so what do, I, what do I think of, if they say no to that, I, not the people who are in charge at the BBC, and I will never be in charge at the BBC, would use some very rude language and say, right, we're going to put advertising on uh, Radio 1 and Radio 2, and that will screw everybody else in the industry. And if you want us to be commercial, we'll be commercial. And, you know, you won't like it. Um, I think I, I heard somebody talking yesterday, I think, about the, the BBC going down to a core public service, uh, which I, I know, what would that, uh, which is so difficult to define that at the moment we do look, I mean, you know, I think it's quite easy to say the news is a public service, but is something like Wolf Hall, which is clearly quality drama, but clearly will sell, is that dis defined as public service? I mean, certainly it's in, within what I would see as public service, but you could equally argue um, that, that 
that it's commercial. You can look at other stuff that's on the BBC and say there's no way that that, that is only something the BBC could do. But the, their argument is we've got to provide the same sort of quiz shows and reality shows and whatever as everybody else. Otherwise, we're not popular. We're, we're, we're using the licence fee in an elitist way and making it for you know, sort of upper-middle-class people rather than the population as a whole. Do I personally have some sort of sympathy uh, with the argument that's anathema to the BBC bosses, but that Channel 4 and others doing quality public service type programming should have a slice of the money? You know, I, I, I understand that. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, and also sort of just this practical things. They talk about subscription. Well, that can only work on TV, and it does does work. I mean, I think, you know, in, in the States, I used to get HBO. It's a fantastic channel. Loads of great stuff on it, and quite happy to, to pay for it um, because of, you know, really just for a couple of shows, and then you see you've got all the others, and I'm sure people would feel like that about the BBC. But what about radio? You can't stop people listening to radio. So does that mean that, you know, that somebody who, say, just wanted to listen to... Radio One is subsidised by people who subscribe to BBC One and BBC Two. I, I think there's lots of... I'm glad I don't have to sort it out. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll give you the tip that uh, <clears throat> Peter Allen, who's on Radio 5 and was a colleague at IRN, um, gave me, and I think it works well. There are two questions that nearly always work. One is, why? And the other is, really? <laughs> and, and really, it's, it's such a great question, because people go, I, well, because you, 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 without actually sort of undermining their argument you've suggested there's some huge flaw that anybody who's not an idiot can see, and so it makes them justify themselves. But I, I suppose there's more sort of serious... I mean, I do mean those seriously, but the, listen to what they're saying. Try, and it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's really difficult. I've found in a, in a studio... You know, I'm used to doing TV and radio interviews uh, outside a context of live broadcasting, but when you've got you know people handing you scripts and you're trying to work, am I going to that item or that? Have they dropped that one or, or you know where's my mouse to move it on the screen to get it on the screen? But so sometimes you just let people blither on and, and then pick up with your next question. But you know that's always a bad interview. You should be just listen to what they're saying, try and pick up what what they they're giving way on, and and you know don't. Don't be ever afraid to check. Don't be, you know, obviously not rude or confrontational for the sake of it, but don't be afraid to challenge them. Just before I say thank you to Mark, just bear with me while I run through this afternoon's schedule. Um, hopefully, you all remember that we squeezed Jeremy Armstrong from the Daily Mirror into yesterday's schedule because he's working on a big story today, so he won't be here at two o'clock. The next session is three fifteen when we've got uh, Joanna Abaye, a showbiz entertainment reporter an entrepreneur. And then that's followed at 4.30 by Michael Herod, who's the foreign editor from ITN, and he's one of um, our postgraduate alumni as well, so back in here at 3.15. But um, what a privilege, again, to hear from somebody who's reported from across the world and can bring to life for us, um, you know, reporting from those places that we see on the news um, and, and gives an insight into some of the issues that we'll all see coming to life in the next few weeks with the general election coverage. So please join me saying thank you to Mark. Thank you. Thank you.